Okay, so today we're looking at the blog by George Scott, A Ride of Two Halves, which is text 4.1. Um, obviously, it's a blog, right? We get told that in the um, title, so that's pretty straightforward in terms of the genre. The audience is clearly cyclists, okay, because we've got it coming from Road Cycling UK. If you want to be more specific, you could be clear that readers of Road Cycling UK, perhaps people who are fans of George Scott might be um, tuning in to read this blog as well. In terms of the purpose, it's also uh, functions a bit like a travel blog, so it describes the journey that he goes on. So one of the purposes is to inform us about this journey, you know, perhaps people who are really into their road cycling are going to be inspired by it and go off and do the journey themselves. However, it's a blog, um, it's also got to entertain us or we're not going to go onto the website and read it. We do have the conventions of a blog format here, okay, so we've got all of the different tabs that we can go to so that kind of fits with all the graphological or the layout conventions and all of these lexical items here gear racing and sportive they're all items that would be linked to road cycling and um, the kind of generic features continue here we've got the different links that we can click on um, to the different website blog pages then it opens with this phrasal template, a ride of two halves. Okay, it's a phrasal template because it comes from uh, the phrase that we would know that's familiar to as a game of two halves. Now we know that the audience is cyclists, but perhaps they're gonna be people with more likely to have an interest in sport more generally. So that's gonna be familiar to them. It's gonna help to engage the reader. And we're gonna want to find out because if it's a ride of two halves, what is it that happens that's different in the second half to the first half? Now blogs are often um, less formal and we see that being evident in this little opening here. Day two's mountain ride left most of the group with sore legs. Um, so we've got a bit of a lesion happening here which gives uh, a sort of informality to the opening. And that's kind of uh, reinforced with the ellipsis here as well. And we've also got an exophoric reference. This is day two. So that implies that if you are really into your road cycling you might want to go and pick up day one. And there's probably an earlier blog that describes what happens there. Now, in terms of how he describes himself throughout the piece and the voice, this is interesting too. So most of the group was sore legs. I think there's definitely an implication as we go on to read that he's one of the better cyclists there. Um, and that works in terms of giving the voice more credibility as well with the readership. He then continues, ahead of the third day of training camp, so we set out for a four hour loop on the flat coastal roads of North Mohaka. Um, so what we've got happening here is a kind of geographical description, the flat coastal roads, remembering that this works as a, a travel blog as well, so that helps to give it that sense of place, so we can try and imagine uh, what it's like, and that helps to engage the reader. Uh, and then we start with some difficulty. Trouble is, okay, and there's another elision going on there, which gives it again that sort of conversational tone. You could describe it as a conversational discourse marker. It feels like we're part way through something. And it's also interesting in terms of the voice that we start off with this problem. So that helps to engage the reader. Um, so trouble is we now had a headwind worthy of the Northern classics. This is important, um, kind of there's some assumed knowledge here um, that a specialist reference, the Northern Classics is like a famous uh, ro uh, cycling racing uh, place. Um, so that's kind of quite context bound and um, it's capitalized, isn't it? So it's like a proper noun. Um, and obviously if you are one of the audience and you're into your road cycling, you're going to know what this is. It's going to mean something to you. Um, he then continues to, con to contend with and there was still plenty of opportunity to hurt the legs when sitting on the front of the bunch but after an early cafe stop on the beachfront and a chance to work on tan lines in the sun we ventured inland and continued on the planned route. What you need to notice about that opening paragraph is that it is it has punctuation errors in it okay there's comma splices and there's no full stops um, what that does is it kind of uh, reinforces this informal tone or the informal voice that we get in the opening. Um, there's an interesting juxtaposition which is evident here and which continues throughout the blog between the pain that he's experiencing, okay, so he talks about having his legs hurt, and then the sense that this is also a holiday, so there's a chance to work on the tan lines. 
So this uh, this is going to appeal, I think, to the road cyclist. So there is this holiday element, but it's also really important that he emphasises the kind of physical exertion of cycling to his audience because that's going to be what appeals to them. Um, this verb choice is interesting. We ventured inland, okay? So we've definitely got connotations of it being an adventure, which helps to make it sound more exciting for the audience. And it also connotes this sense of risk and adversity, which fits in with this juxtaposition that we were talking about. Um, I have actually highlighted the kind of geographical Lexus in blue for you throughout, okay? So that's why the Worthy of the Northern Classics is highlighted in blue there. Okay, let's move this down a little bit. Okay, so then we're on to the second paragraph. So Andalusia is both beautiful and barren in equal measures. So we've got another phrasal template here. Okay, this is a phrase that we people be used to is both something and something in equal measures, and you can kind of fill in uh, your two words there depending on what you're describing. What that does is it makes it easier to understand for um, the audience. It's not a particularly high literary piece of work, uh, a blog, okay? So we expect it to be easily accessible. It's not like we're picking up a huge novel. And so using phrasal templates helps to um, make it more accessible for the reader and to kind of keep them engaged. There's also an antithesis here between beautiful and barren, which is really emphasized by the alliteration. And that fits in with the kind of juxtaposition that was coming before of both kind of um, holiday and pain. And here we've got kind of the beauty and the barrenness. Um, we also then get this parenthesis next. So uh, Mohaka receives just 200 millimeters of rain per year. So the parenthesis there is adding information um, specific to the kind of geographical location and that gives more credibility to his voice. We need to believe that he knows what he's talking about, okay, and, and having that parenthesis helps him to establish that credible voice. Um, we'll come back to these numerals later, okay, but what I've done is highlighted them in um, yellow, okay, so you can see those. The phrasal templates are in green, so they stand out for you because that is a feature of the voice as well. Uh, he continues then, and yesterday's mountain peaks had now been replaced by arid coastal plains with little to take the mind off the strengthening wind. Okay, so it's interesting to notice that this geographical Lexus continues describing the mountain peaks and the arid coastal plains. And that really gives us a sense of, of place and helps us to understand where he's describing. And then he continues to emphasize the adversity. So notice that at the beginning paragraph, oh, there it is, uh, he talked about the headwind. And then he really starts to emphasize and repeat that as a challenging force to be reckoned with. So he intensifies it here by describing it as the strengthening wind. Now that's interesting that it's in the present continuous tense, okay, because that helps us to get this idea of the ongoing difficulty. And there's also repetition, which is then reinforced in the next bit here, where he describes it as a block headwind. So in both of these second occasions, he decides to pre-modify his noun phrase. And what that does is it really emphasizes the adversity. That's going to make it more engaging for the readership, but it also presents him as a more adept uh, cyclist. This whole sentence here, give me hills and a view to work for over a death march into a block headwind. Now, it's not literally a death march, is it? As far from it, he's cycling on a holiday, okay? So what we've got there is some hyperbole. And what that hyperbole is doing is it's showing you really how challenging he's trying to really convey the adversity and the difficulty of the road cycling here. And um, there is also kind of military connotations to the idea of marching, and that helps to give it this sense of, of maybe kind of adventure and excitement. And that military Lexus continues throughout as well, and I've highlighted that military Lexus in orange for you so that you can see that clearly. Okay, so let's go on into the third paragraph. Now, what's interesting is that each of these paragraphs now um, begins with a discourse marker. So, uh, so with 35 miles on the clock, we waved our goodbyes after a short descent. We now had, by now we were, and James was now. So the text really settles into a linear narrative 
with each paragraph moved along by the discourse markers. There are also short paragraphs, okay, so that imagine like it's a blog, so you're going to be reading it on your computer or potentially on your phone, so having those nice short paragraphs makes it much easier to follow. Okay, we've also uh, got the numerals continuing here. Okay, and again, having these specific numbers really helps to give a sense of credibility to what he's saying, that we can rely on him. Okay, so, so with 35 miles on the clock. Now, that's another phrasal template. Okay, so again, there's that sense of kind of familiarity um, and making it more understandable for his readers. He then uses a euphemism, so we stop for a comfort break and split the group in two. Okay, it's more appropriate to say a comfort break, um, even though it's an informal text, there's still a kind of politeness to it, which comes through in the euphemism there. And now this is a bit where he, I suppose, starts to present himself as being better than the other riders there, because he says how with the majority of the riders opting to stay with the lead car and continuing on the original route back to Badar, while our ride guide, James and I, turned right into the hills for a lumpier loop back to base. So it's interesting that it's just the guide and him um, who decide to go for the tougher ride, okay? Everybody else just carries on on the planned route. And I thought it was also interesting the way that the and I comes as parenthesis. So it's really emphasizing that it's just him and the other and the guide, who is obviously going to be a brilliant cyclist, who decides to take the more difficult route. So it's another way in which he really emphasizes the difficulty there. Um, we've got the proper nouns continuing here, so continuing to give it a sense of place. Um, and also a little bit of alliteration. So there are some literary features in this text too, even though it's more informal and accessible to kind of engage the reader's interest. So we get this idea of a lumpier loop. So that's a liquid L repetition. That's a nice long sound. And as well as that, you've got the long OO vowel sound there, which really kind of creates the sound of a looping effect with those long noises. Here, look, another little bit of military lexis to kind of continue that sense of both adversity and excitement. Um, discourse marker used to kind of indicate that we're moving on here. So we waved our goodbyes and immediately turned off the main road and into the orange groves. So we've got this adverb immediately, and what that's doing is it's showing us the excitement. Okay, he's on this, um, he really wants to get going along this difficult route. Uh, he also describes the orange groves, which helps us as the audience to have a clear sense of Spain and, and have a good sense of place. To begin a steady drag to the foot of a snaking two-mile car-free climb, with the ridge above us now offering protection from the wind and beautiful views back over the valley for company. So in both these cases here, we've got pre-modification. And what that's doing is it's enabling him to um, describe the journey with both economy, but also with kind of like providing a sense of place for us. Uh, he then personifies the valley and that really reflects the positivity okay so th this initial section is all about the awful headwind so that's one half and now we're on to the ride of the second half where him and the guide go off together on this kind of challenging but beautiful journey and they finally got away from the headwind um, and then he continues so again we've talked about the discourse markers I just move this down there we go um, after a short descent, now we get um, some plosive alliteration here, descent, detour, detour, which is a much harder sound, isn't it? Maybe creating the, down, the sound of going down the hill, maybe that's a bit of a stretch. Um, but what we definitely get here is, is a, uh, a, a kind of sense of incrementum. So we took a detour off our detour is repeated there detour and detour okay and that sense of building incrementum so that shows us the challenge is increasing and he's really enjoying it um and then we get this aside who had uh sorry with james and then the aside who had previously visited the area on a training camp of his own in december now what that aside does it's kind of adds some commentary it gives us a little bit of information about james and that helps to engage our interest um this is another little bit 
potentially of military Lexus. I know we'd have a sporting training camp too, um, but that helps to kind of reinforce this kind of idea of it as a real adventure. So he'd been on a training camp of his own in December before returning at the start of March as a ride guide for Wheels and Wheels, keen to explore a back road over the ridge, which took us back to Badar. Um, so uh, the only other thing really that I could spot here is that we've got this kind of geographical Lexus continuing, helping us to have a sense of kind of place and journey. Um, and then we get this idiom, we now had the wind on our back. Okay, so again, idiom, linking to informality, helping us to get a sense of his journey and his adventure, and clipped along comfortably, where well, you've got another bit of alliteration there, actually, which I hadn't written down, but also the dynamic verb clip creates a sense of journey and excitement, um, and here also, it's easy, isn't it? You know, the first half was really difficult with the headwind, and now he's clipping along comfortably, really enjoying himself. Now it's interesting that earlier on he was using miles, okay, back up here, so with 35 miles on the clock, but he's recording his speed in kilometers per hour. Uh, maybe that inconsistency is just Britishness, okay, because we refuse to give up miles per hour, but it does also allow him to exaggerate slightly um, because obviously kilometers per hour is going to be faster, so that's going to give him a better number there. Um, this is another aside, really, that he clipped along comfortably at 55 kilometers an hour. So another aside, kind of adding a bit more interest and a bit more detail. And then we get the alliteration of the rolling road. And so the R sound is quite long, isn't it? And the repetition of it maybe kind of creates that sound and reflects the shape of the road. Um, more geographical kind of Lexus gradual downhill gradient which is giving him more credibility and then we get this simile which felt like heaven okay which is really coming back to this idea that yes it's a difficult journey but he finds fun in that um, and obviously more the numerals whilst they're inconsistent they are also establishing him as being kind of factual you know he, we've got to believe that he's been on this journey if we're going to bother to read the blog and we're going to see him as a reliable source move this down to oh sorry that's a bit wobbly isn't it move this down to the bottom section now okay so by now we're in the middle of nowhere not entirely sure of the route and with only a farmer and his herd of goats for company but this is what cycling is about okay so let's look first of all at the kind of hyperbole they're not in the middle of nowhere because there's a farmer here so it's not uncharted territory kind of the middle of nowhere in the uncharted territory is where he's being slightly hyperbolic okay and that kind of gives it a sense of mystery doesn't it it emphasizes the idea of freedom that he's trying to create in this section but actually there is a farmer and his goats there so clearly people do live there but the hyperbole that kind of fits in with what we'd expect from this kind of a travel blog that for him it, it does feel remote um, and then he continues exploring uncharted territory with the wind and the sun on your back well that's a familiar collocation um, and again that helps us to um, get a sense of like what the weather's like and how much he's enjoying himself and the traffic free road rising before you. So it's also another feature that he tends to kind of pre-modify the nouns and the description. And that, like we've already said, as the kind of economy and the interest. After one wrong turn and then another, so you've got a sense of increment and building up there again, which builds that sense of an adventure. We took a dirt road and descended into the valley, crossing the bone dry riverbed and picking our way up the track on the opposite side of the mountainside before the tarmac returned. Um, so again, this bit here just really fits with all the bits I've highlighted in blue so that there's a semantic field of travel and place, which is giving the background and the information and the credibility. Um, again, the, the bone dry riverbed, another example of the pre-modification there. Um, and of course, the uncharted territory also fits in with the kind of military Lexus that's been used so far in the adventure. James was now back on familiar territory, so repetition of territory, that military Lexus, and we climbed up the hillside on a series of steep ramps with a beautifully smooth, freshly laid road surface. 
With Badar in sight, we skipped past the turning for our villa and joined the rest of the group in the village for a cold drink after 90 minutes of some of the best riding of the camp so far. So we've also got another dynamic verb here in skipped, which is again showing that ease of travel. We've talked about the military lexus, we've talked about the numerals, and it really finishes with this idea of, you know, that the, the second half of the ride was really enjoyable with all the descriptions, beautifully smooth, freshly laid. You've got those pre-modifiers there again. 